uh, welcome to Baha'i Viewpoint. I'm Mike O'Neill, and we have another good show for you today. Uh, I have a couple of good friends with me today um, who are going to discuss an issue that you've heard discussed before on Baha'i Viewpoint, but uh, as Baha'is, we think this issue is of tremendous importance, and I like having the opportunity to bring you the opinion of friends who are maybe not from the Savannah area, but bring a different perspective on this topic. Uh, we have here Marvin Doc Holliday. Hello. How you doing? And Chris, Christopher Gordine. Mm -hmm. I call it Chris. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and, and, and they've done, uh, they've put together somewhat of a presentation mm -hmm. on, on the racial divide. And we have, uh, what we try to do is, uh, is assemble the opposite ends of the dichotomy, if you will. Right. And people would say that uh, a, a, a young black gentleman mm -hmm. and a old, <laughs> uh, uh, a, 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 a less young oh, oh, white oh, oh, gentleman <laughs> could possibly represent the, the, the greatest polarization yeah, in the, the dichotomy. That's the, that's the extremes, know? right. So, so mm -hmm. it's important that if, if we can uh, talk about this, that if we can talk about it with this extreme, it should be less difficult for those who are not as extreme to talk about it. Hopefully. Chris, um, what brought you guys together to discuss this? Okay, well, I'm a fairly new Baha'i, mm -hmm. and what initially brought us together was my investigation of the faith. Mm -hmm. I'd heard about it, and, uh, and Doc here was a person that was pointed out as a good person for me to talk to. Mm -hmm. And um, that initially brought us together. And then after we got to talking, um, despite the outer differences you see to the eye, mm -hmm. you know, race, mm -hmm. age, and so forth, he and I share a lot of uh, common opinions. Mm -hmm. And just a person to person level, uh, get along very well. And so mm -hmm. that's, that's what's uh, been a real good uh, bonding force. Ah, yes, yes. Doc, what's your Yeah, it, uh, it was like, um, I don't know whether this is the proper thing to say or not, but it's, it was it really be, became uh, a situation where, you know, Chris kind of really filled the role of being the kind of a person I had always wanted my son to be, had the conversation mm -hmm. I always wanted to have with my son, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, so we, in, in a sense, I got, uh, Chris and I have kind of adopted each other mm -hmm. in, in, in that, that father-son kind of relationship. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's worked out really well for us because uh, uh, it's been possible, therefore, for me to, uh, to create an environment for Chris to start to really reach down and come up with the stuff that's been buried in mm -hmm. there for years. Oh, yes. Well... Something has to exist between you two um, to be able to have this dialogue, which is quite commonly very emotionally charged. Mm -hmm. As it should be. And, 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 and some people find it grating and quite uncomfortable. Um, even though you're both Baha'is, mm -hmm. you know, what's been your experience with discussing an issue like this that is emotionally charged? Chris? Yeah. Um, my experience um, has been like in America, basically, it's very divided racially, and people don't avoid this topic. You can have people who are neighbors, friends, black, white, whatever, mm -hmm. but, um, and especially across uh, racial lines, we tend to avoid this topic. We talk about everything else and avoid mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. um, so with uh, Doc, it was a, a new experience for me, and in fact, it took a while for me to get comfortable just opening up. Mm -hmm. You know, Doc had been a Baha'i for a while, and so he's upfront kind of guy. He laid things out on the table. Mm -hmm. And um, after seeing him kind of do that, I fell, uh, followed his lead. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so uh, it took some getting used to. Yes. But it was very refreshing. Yes. Uh, that's the biggest thing about it. Yes, yes. Well, even, even among people of the same color. Yeah, because yeah, sometimes because people don't want to deal with it. Exactly. We, yeah, we'll, we'll begin to discuss it. Mm -hmm. And then uh, I have found myself mm -hmm. um, in a group of people of the same color as I saying things along the racial lines, which, you know, I, I really don't agree with, but I, I, I it's a real <laughs> challenge, it's a real challenge yeah, yeah, to yeah. state that mm -hmm. in that group, right. yeah, in yeah. that, in that mm -hmm. setting. Mm -hmm. Doc, I mean, how, how? Yeah, well, see, I've, I've been blessed, and you, you know about this. Mm -hmm. so I've been blessed, because I, you know, I've, I was, through my, the, the, my, my adult life, really, mm -hmm. 
I have been nurtured by the African American community. Mm -hmm. I, my performance career was with primarily, uh, you know, uh, black orchestras, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. or at least orchestras that were predominantly black, mm -hmm. you know, and mm -hmm. uh, you know. So I've spent so many years in the community mm -hmm. that I was already aware of much of that, which is, you know, has been the cause of mm -hmm. this suppression. Mm -hmm. And you know, and I understand the need for that suppression in a sense. Mm -hmm. But I also know the need for giving it up. Mm -hmm. You know, bringing mm -hmm. it forth, mm -hmm. bringing it forth, putting it on the table so that we can both deal with it. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. that's the important part. We need to deal with it, not as you know, as finding a mechanism to accommodate and to be, you know, to. Uh, be nice about it, mm -hmm. so to speak, you mm -hmm. know, yeah. but really embrace it, mm -hmm. make it a part of who you are, and uh, therefore you can then respond to it in a, in, a, in, a, a, in a sort of sensibility for what that must be and what, what I, you know, I always knew I could go across the street mm -hmm. and not have to be, and, and I, I'm, I'm free mm -hmm. of it, you know, mm -hmm. I, I knew I could right. do that. Right. I look, you know, I look okay. Mm -hmm. you what know? you're saying that as being a white person, you can walk. I walk across the street. And no, I got go. no more problems. Right. But I understand. I made the choice not to mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. I understood what was there, mm -hmm. and I wanted to be a part of what was there. Mm -hmm. Now we could get to that another time. Right. That, right. That, right. That, that's yeah. right. Preaching. Well, <laughs> okay. Of course, you you met each other. Uh, a great deal of this had to be due to the fact that you're both Baha'is. Well, now, yeah, now, now yeah. is that how it happened? That's yeah. how it happened? Yes, exactly. That's sure. exactly now, right. how has the teachings of the faith, how has that uh, lent some ease, or how has it guided your dialogue? It's been absolutely essential. This dialogue could not have existed without the teachings of Baha'u'llah, well, my true. teachings. Mm -hmm. And what I found uh, specifically is as, as I started to address this emotionally charged issue, once I have a lot of personal pain with and experience, mm -hmm. as most people in mm -hmm. America, especially African Americans, have mm -hmm. personal experience with racism, mm -hmm. you know, you bring this stuff up from inside of you, memories or just mm -hmm. feelings you have, it takes you off in this direction, mm -hmm. away from unity, and then, but the, the role of the Baha'i teachings, if you remember them, it, it, they bring you back to love mm -hmm. and to unity, and especially with fellow Baha'is, as mm -hmm. well as everyone else in the, mm -hmm. in the community. And so I would express these feelings using some tact and so forth, but if I needed to, just the raw language I needed to use. Right. Mm -hmm. right. But then I also remember, here's a fellow believer, another mm -hmm. brother, mm -hmm. and I used uh, Baha'u'llah's words to guide me back towards mm -hmm. him, mm -hmm. towards mm -hmm. unity. Right, mm -hmm. right, right, right. Yeah. And so it's a healing. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. A purging and a healing. With, with, with me, I have found that it, it the teaching of the faith and the stance of the faith gave me uh, gave me time, gave me time okay. to work through my stuff. Mm. You yeah. know, my anxiety, mm -hmm. my lack of trust, mm -hmm. my hatred of self, mm -hmm. and the hatred that I, I projected. Right. Mm -hmm. Because I said, well, the writings say this. If I stick with the writings, mm -hmm. as uh, until I get it, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. until I've practiced mm -hmm. long enough, mm -hmm. it'll mm -hmm. it'll it'll, sure. it'll get me sure. where I need to go. Well, this it's like it's, it's, we were talking about this on the way down. It's like it's like realizing, and that's that's you know, frankly, my role. Mm -hmm. I say my role in a sweeping generalization mm -hmm. for those who look like me. Mm -hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. yeah. our role really is to to create a familial environment. Okay. Family environment. Okay. 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 So that we, uh, that this, uh, so much so that that it's not um, a, it's not a an, an exercise, but a genuine uh, embracing mm -hmm. of our oneness. Mm -hmm. You know, to, mm -hmm. to 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 embrace the fact that this is, it, you know, these this is one family. This mm -hmm. is not two or three or four different families. Mm -hmm. This is one mm -hmm. family. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we because th th we get th this this the whole the whole problem with having physical characteristics that mm -hmm. are different is that it gets in the way. Yes, there's you know we, we th it's it's the way that one was able to perpetrate what was perpetrated. Mm -hmm. You know, 
But <laughs> the, the thing we have to do is to create a, an environment beyond that mm -hmm. in which the, um, the embracing of our oneness. In other words, mm -hmm. like, I have to embrace mm -hmm. my blackness. Mm -hmm. Okay? Mm -hmm. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Interesting. You see? Because yeah. there is, in fact, mm -hmm. a blackness about my reality. Mm -hmm. not, not only because I was a part of, of that community mm -hmm. for so long, but our reality mm -hmm. is that we're a part of each other. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, really right. a part exactly. of each other. Exactly. And so, therefore, I need... I mean, I, white, mm -hmm. need to create an environment by getting, by eliminating from our consciousness or our subconscious, if possible, mm -hmm. any elements or any traces of that, 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 that innate kind of superiority mm -hmm. that, that was a part of mm -hmm. being white as opposed to being black. Mm -hmm. Okay? This, we've got to rid ourselves of that. Right. And when we do that, that opens a door, mm -hmm. you see, that makes it possible. If I'd have carried on with that typical attitude toward Chris, Chris could never have opened up. Right. He could never have said to me right. the things because he's, you know, he's, he's, he's been through all the things he's been through and he's, he's survived it by protecting himself and by putting it deeper, mm -hmm. right? Now, he couldn't release that unless I create, an I create the environment right. in which he can release that. Right. That's my role. Yes, yes, and you're absolutely right because also the writings say you you brought up several things. The exactly. writings say, of course, but the writings say that uh, people of of uh, African descent have some things they have to do. Also. Of course, they do. And what we'll do is you brought up some very interesting things, and we'll take just a short break, and we'll, we'll come back, back yeah, and good. and uh, discuss this further. This sure. is going to be this cool. is going to be nice. All right. Okay, we'll be back right after this short message. <laughs> For a free copy of the Baha'is Magazine, call 800-22-UNITE. The magazine is filled with articles and photographs of Baha'is working to create a better world. Find out about this growing movement. The Baha'is Magazine describes a community of people who are making a difference. Call now for your free copy, 800-22-UNITE, or visit the website at www.us.baha'i.org. There's no obligation. Um. On this stanza, uh, we're going to first uh, elaborate just a little bit, or sum up this little bit about what we talked about mm -hmm. in the last stanza. We, uh, Doc, when we finished up the last stanza, you had mentioned the uh, something I'm thinking is very interesting: the role that people who appear like yourself have. Mm -hmm. But of course, we know that there's another side of that coin. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, and of course, just by the way we were born we do in fact represent segments of our society yeah. mm -hmm. not that we tend not not that we think that our views are are universal mm -hmm. for people that look like us yeah. but we do we are part of that statistic yeah. mm -hmm. in the dialogue between uh, americans of african descent and americans of european descent our writings say some say a couple of things doc alluded to uh, the removal of an innate feeling of superiority, mm -hmm. sometimes unconscious. Mm -hmm. But Chris, if I'm not mistaken, mm -hmm. there is another part that our writings talk about that Americans of African descent yeah. have to work with. And I have found it quite challenging. What are your views on it? What's addressed in our writings, it talks about the barriers that exist in, um, in, in, the, in the African American community that prevent unity from occurring. Mm -hmm. And we're not used to that. We, we were raised, we have to think about that for a second. Mm -hmm. We're raised in a society that's racially divided, racist if you will, mm -hmm. and we're conditioned to responding a certain way. Mm -hmm. But now in the Baha'i context, we're talking about changing that, that outer society, so it means that we have to change in order to be, become a part of that. Mm -hmm. and, and so what's mentioned specifically is um, a, a general blanket mistrust mm -hmm. of people, if you will, because they're white. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And what we have to look at, as Dr. King talked about, 
is looking at the content of character. If you see how the individual is, mm -hmm. to be able to open yourself up to relate to that, relate to the individual, mm -hmm. not to mm -hmm. to have a shield up with everyone you come mm -hmm. across, no matter what mm -hmm. they seem like, because you're just not going to trust them. Because if, obviously, if we talk about that right now, that's uh, that's going to prevent us from making any progress. Right. Yeah. Right. Well, now we come on the show and we talk about race unity. Uh, and, and I personally think it's important um, that people understand what the Baha'i concept of unity mm -hmm. is mm -hmm. uh, as opposed to what some mm -hmm. might see the mm -hmm. unity. Mm -hmm. uh, yep. Anybody has? That's any? great. I, 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 I love this because it is not what everybody else, you know, we have all kinds of organizations and all, all kinds of groups of people who are seriously, seriously, with, with good intent, trying to bring about a, uh, a, a relationship that we get along well or mm -hmm. we can accommodate each other, mm -hmm. uh, we can develop respect for each other, all that mm -hmm. sort of thing. That ain't the answer. That's only the, that's only the surface. Mm -hmm. That's only dealing with the surface of the reality. The reality is that we must embrace the essence of each other. Mm. I mean, it's not enough that I, I respect Chris or that I like Chris mm -hmm. or that I, you know, I know his, his, his values and so forth and I, I, I appreciate those values. It's, it's, it goes way beyond that. Mm -hmm. I have, it has to be where I wish to truly embrace him, mm -hmm. his totality, mm -hmm. not only what he appears to be but what he is mm -hmm. and what he is internally and and I have to embrace his pain I have to embrace what he's gone through I have to embrace what his parents have gone through mm -hmm. what his grandparents you know we go through mm -hmm. that whole we know that and as he shares that with me I can I can even know more you mm -hmm. see mm -hmm. and I must be able to embrace that and not with the carrying around a guilt package mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. but embrace it as a part of truth right part of reality this what happened mm -hmm. this is the way this went but we don't have to stay there mm -hmm. we can go to another level we can go to another place mm -hmm. and that's what I mean be embracing the love as Baha'u'llah makes reference we you know, it's one family all humanity of one family mm -hmm. and that family has the love that we that we expect to mm. have in a family. Hmm. All right. Well, there are some things that we face when oh, trying to oh, do oh, these yeah, things. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, because I meet with many, many Baha'is and talk on this topic. Uh, uh, some of my friends who are of European descent uh, have said sometimes they feel like a traitor in the midst when they're in the when they're in the meeting when they're in a group a meeting with other people who are of European descent and they're, those people are, are sharing what they believe yeah. and they feel like uh, spies, for instance. <laughs> now we, I know that sometimes when I'm talking about race unity that there's a sense of someone maybe perceiving me as selling out, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. what, what are your thoughts on, you know, not, not, not having the same um, radical feeling Mm -hmm. You know that exists. Yeah, right, uh, right. Uh, you know, yeah. the truth of the matter is, my feelings may be more radical. Mm -hmm. Yes. But what are your feelings on that, Chris? That's a, a very good point. Because uh, as a, as a, when I was a new Baha'i, very new Baha'i, I had that perception too. I was like, wow, this is all, see, all lovey dovey, nice. It's like, mm -hmm. where's the fire in it? Where's your passion? Where's your mm -hmm. blackness, so to speak? Mm -hmm. And, uh, but I came to realize that as, as I became more, uh, more and more deepened as a Baha'i, mm -hmm. I looked back and looked at the outer society. We're raised in a society where, like a tug of war, there's a rope, white people are on one side, and to be black, you have to grab the opposite side mm. and pull this way, because if you don't, you're going to get drugged. Mm. And so these two sides are like pulling, and this is the way mm. American history has been. Mm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, you talk about selling out, you have that perspective only because you see reality in terms of either on this side of the rope or that side. Mm -hmm. The Baha'i perspective is to let go of that and both unite. Mm -hmm. And so there's no need to pull on a rope. You come to the table with your opinions, your mm -hmm. experiences, mm -hmm. your pains, if you will, and so, do the, so does the other side, but we come together. Mm -hmm. And see, there's no need to pull on that rope. 
And so it's not so long as transcending. Mm -hmm. and so you're going past, beyond all that, the conflict of the past. Mm -hmm. Right, right. Remember the lessons. Right. But you work to but go past those. Passive. Yeah. Very, very, very interesting. With and honesty. We'll Exactly. Yeah, that's, yes. that's, that's like also a key factor. Yeah. Mm -hmm. This is very important, mm -hmm. and we'll pick this up right after this message. Okay, good. Is that okay, okay with you guys? Great. Sure. Okay, great. we'll be right back after this very important message. Stick around. For a free copy of the Baha'is Magazine, call 800-22-UNITE. The magazine is filled with articles and photographs of Baha'is working to create a better world. Find out about this growing movement. The Baha'is Magazine describes a community of people who are making a difference. Call now for your free copy, 800-22-UNITE, or visit the website at www.us.baha'i.org. There's no obligation. Yes, yes, that was a, a very important dialogue, Chris. I, I, I love what you said about uh, the about letting go of the rope, <laughs> dropping the rope. Yeah. Uh, there is no winner in that. Yeah, right, yeah. Right. You know, only losers mm -hmm. drop the rope. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> but you know, we sit here and talk about race unity a lot. Yeah, right, right. Mm -hmm. uh, and I guess that's because what? We have all the answers? <laughs> no. We got, we got no. it just right, right? In the Baha'i community, we no. have no problems, no, right? No, no. not at all. Okay. We're, we're in a process. Yeah. Talk to me. This is, a, this is a process. This is not an event. Right. This is right. a process that we're going to be going through for some time. Right. As a matter of fact, we're just now really getting honest and some, some you know, we, mm -hmm. as a Baha'i community, mm -hmm. we're starting to really understand that there is a process mm -hmm. for uh, coming to resolution mm -hmm. or coming to... I'm sorry, embracement of, of this, mm -hmm. of this the, the most challenging issue, which is black-white. Mm -hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. now, once we, once we be just begin this process, then all of a sudden we have to start realizing that there's also the Native American Indian mm -hmm. and then the Oriental mm -hmm. and then, of course, the largest minority in this country, which is the Spanish, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. the Mexican, Chicano, mm -hmm. you know, Latino, how, whatever you want to identify. Mm -hmm. then, that becomes also a part mm -hmm. of this of, you know, of this process that we're mm -hmm. involved in. Mm -hmm. So answers, yes, we have some answers. Do we have it in place? No. Mm -hmm. But we are in a process of mm -hmm. getting it there. Mm -hmm. And I think that the process itself, what entails the process, is as important as the end result. Right, mm -hmm. right. You know, you guys put this presentation together and you decided to come here and talk. So you decided to take a, a leadership role. What gives you guys the gall <laughs> and the courage to stand up and say, I'm going to work on this when, uh, when others may not? Mm -hmm. Chris? Yeah. For me personally, it's just the outrage of some of the things that occur. Sometimes on a daily basis, but also the things I think we're assaulted with in the, through the media mm -hmm. that occur. Um, you know, a kid riding on a bicycle through the wrong neighborhood in mm -hmm. Chicago gets uh, beaten until he's in a, in a coma. Mm -hmm. Someone gets dragged mm -hmm. behind the back of a pickup truck until their, their body comes apart. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. those things are outrageous. I think mm -hmm. what's essential is that even if people are not necessarily fully aware of the Baha'i principles, any person of conscience is, is, is outraged by these events. Mm -hmm. And I think it's time that those of us who have a similar mindset about coming together mm -hmm. need to do so. We need to act because when we, when we sit here and we're uh, complacent, mm -hmm. when we don't talk about these issues, we don't try to get to the pain and bridge these gaps, mm -hmm. we leave a space for mm -hmm. people to do these type of acts. Yes. yes. And so I think uh, we should not allow a very small percentage of the population who may be violently inclined or whatever um, to make life so bad for the rest of us. Mm -hmm. The other 85, 90 percent of us need to come together. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, our, we have to be, somebody has to be the example. Mm -hmm. Somebody has to exa exemplify by their deeds, not necessarily by their words, but 
course, mm -hmm. words help support. Mm -hmm. But by their deeds, by their reality, mm -hmm. by their by their personal existence, must demonstrate these principles in 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 in, in function, mm -hmm. functioning as a part of their lives, mm -hmm. as 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 they have made it a part of their lives. Right. That's it, it's it's important that Chris and I. And of course, you know it's great because here, you know, I'm I'm this extreme and he's that extreme, and that's mm -hmm. one of the reasons why we thought it would mm -hmm. it would be work. Mm -hmm. It would be more 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 applicable mm -hmm. because here's the you know here's these two extreme poles, so to speak, mm -hmm. sitting down and having this kind of a discussion mm -hmm. in front of people, mm -hmm. much as we've done here. Right. Yeah, the impact of that is not so much the words that they use, but what they convey. Mm -hmm. And if the if if, if just the what what it, what we're conveying, if that gets across, mm -hmm. then people realize it can be done. Mm -hmm. I don't have to hold on to that. Mm -hmm. What you know you know either either one of us right. have to hold on to what right. what you know identified us. No, yeah. we can we can but we can drop the rope. I love that exact that 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 imagery. Mm -hmm. We can drop that rope, let it go, mm -hmm. forget it, and 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 go towards. The embracing. Mm. Go towards the embracing. Mm. Well, you know, gentlemen, I'm sure we both, we all know uh, that we've got our work cut out for us. Oh, sure. Uh, I think our writings say that, that this dialogue is, is just wrought with uh, pitfalls. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm sure that in this dialogue and in our attempt to be Baha'is and, mm -hmm. and exhibit what we're trying to exhibit, that, you know, we've been hurt mm -hmm. and we have to, you know, dust ourselves off and continue. Uh, you know, I want to thank you guys mm. for coming and, and representing the Charleston area, the greater Charleston area. <laughs> right. Uh, uh, you're, you're, you're both dear friends mm. and yeah, it means a great deal to me. Uh, we only have a few seconds left. And uh, is there anything you want to say to any of your friends in 30 seconds? No. That'd be important. That no. Yo. No. <laughs> okay. well, thanks for the opportunity to be here. I appreciate that. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Thanks, I, I, I certainly appreciate. Okay. You know. You did good, son. Because. <laughs> <laughs> of course. Okay. All right. Now. Of course, we we have no clergy, so it's up to us. Of yeah, course, we are the clergy. Okay. We are the clergy. If you've heard anything uh, that you'd like to know more about, uh, please feel free to call the number that you've seen on during the show, and will be displayed at the end of the show. Until next time, I'm Mike O'Neill, and this is Bob and Doc Holiday. Holiday. Chris Gordine. <laughs> we'll see you next time. Thanks. Thanks.
thou who has an illumined heart, thou art even as the pupil of the eye, the very wellspring of the light for God's love has cast its rays upon thine inmost being, and thou hast turned in thy face toward the kingdom of thy Lord. Baha'u'llah. Thank you very much, Rick. Hello, I'm Mike O'Neill, and welcome to this issue of Baha'i Viewpoint. Today's show is a very, very special show. I, I'm surrounded by uh, some of my heroes, uh, Rick read a writing a few minutes ago, or just now, from, uh, from uh, it was from Abdul Baha, and he ref said that you referred to something called the pupil of the eye. We will talk about that a great deal as the show uh, advances, but uh, right now I just want you to get a good look at these gentlemen. These gentlemen are people. Uh, from the Savannah community uh, who have attended an event which happens annually in the United States called the Annual Baha'i Black Man's Gathering. All of us have attended at some time and uh, we're going to show a little film today about what happens there and how this group of men have galvanized to serve the cause of God. But first, I'm going to let these guys introduce themselves. Uh, how about this guy up here on the end? Uh, well, I appreciate that. Thank you, sir. <laughs> My name is Daryl O'Neill. I'm the proud son of Mike O'Neill uh, from the Savannah Baha'i community. I uh, attended quite a few of the gatherings, and I'm highly excited mm. about this show mm -hmm. and coming back and talking about what the gatherings has meant to me. Oh, yes. Yes, thank you. And you're going to read a writing for us in a couple minutes, right? Yes, sir. Okay. Mike, I'm Rick, Rick Morgan. Mm. I'm a member of the Savannah Baha'i community. has been for some 38 years. Mm. I came here. I learned about the faith here in Savannah when, back in 1962 and have been an active member in the community ever since. Very much so. I'm here to attest for that. Anise. I'm Anise Morjgani, and um, I've been here part of the Savannah community for, I guess, about five, five years or so. And... Um, I went this past summer for the first time to the Black Men's Gathering, and it was amazing. What did you think? I almost had to drag you up there, but once you got, to... <laughs> it was it was it was something. It, it was, was something really really else, something. Wasn't it? Well, uh, gentlemen, I have been looking forward to doing this show a long time. Um, some people may look at this show and say, uh, "Isn't the Baha'i faith? I mean, isn't isn't unity?" Uh, the purpose behind the Baha'i faith, isn't that what they say? Um, and indeed, that's just, this is true. But of course, uh, within the Baha'i faith, there are mechanisms for achieving that unity. You know, well, one, one of our principles are unity and diversity. Darrell, you were going to uh, say something concerning unity and diversity, and uh, for Baha'is, it's as important as the unity principle itself. Darren? I'm going to share a writing from Baha'i Faith, uh, the principle of unity and diversity. The diversity in the human family should be the cause of love and harmony, as it is in music, where many different notes blend together in the making of a perfect chord. Abdul Baha. Hmm. You know, another analogy that is oft times used in the Baha'i faith is when we talk about, uh, as, as Rick alluded to earlier, uh, people of African descent being referred to as the pupil of the eye. Now, that, that's an analogy that, that puts a group of people uh, as a part of a system. You know, the eyes being a part of the human system. And of course, if we're talking about a system, then we have a heart and a hand and eyes and ears. And each one of these systems are separate, but all are just as valuable to the whole of the, uh, of the, of the, of the body. So the reason I say that is to say 
Each group has its own particular needs, its own particular stuff that it has to address to be its best to contribute to the whole. Well, I'll tell you what, I've talked enough to start this off. I just want the friends to know that this is one in a series of dialogues about the Baha'i faith and how it achieves unity. And the focus of this is the Black Man's Gathering. We're going to be right back uh, after we watch this short film and talk about how we're going to perpetuate this dialogue. Is that okay with you, my brothers? Sounds great. Mm -hmm. Sounds great. We'll be right back after this very short message. I'm going to be walking the grounds that the manifestation of God, I don't, it doesn't matter, even if I couldn't even enter the tomb, or if I could, I had to circumambulate around the whole mountain, that's the close, it, that's, that's enough, I've made it. During the four-year plan, the Universal House of Justice specifically addressed African-American believers, asking them to travel to Africa. In response to this historic call to action, more than 300 African Americans traveled to Africa during the four-year plan. These historic trips of service have their roots in a rich heritage. Baha'is like Bill Foster, Elsie Austin, and Matthew Bullock were among the first to arise to Shoghi Effendi's call for pioneering and travel teaching during the 10-year crusade. These dedicated souls went to the continent of Africa to open territories like Morocco, Libya, and Nigeria. The seeds of these efforts are now being harvested by those who follow. All the participants had previously attended the Black Men's Gathering. These gatherings were given special significance as they were singled out for their importance by the Universal House of Justice. That this exemplary gathering should have produced offers of pioneers and traveling teachers to Africa demonstrated the acuity of their awareness as to the special duties devolving upon the believers of African descent to lend needful support to the continent of their origin. It is a demonstration that must thrill the soul of our departed guardian who dearly wished for such action to be taken increasingly by black Americans. From the Universal House of Justice to the Black Men's Gathering, August 8, 1996. The first gathering was held in Greensboro, North Carolina, in October of 1987. Counselor William Roberts had for years wondered why black men had not made greater contributions to the faith. After much prayer and a study of our sacred writings, Dr. Roberts developed a spiritual and psychological model for the gatherings that would provide an environment that could nurture and empower the souls of the participants. The Baha'i community didn't appear to know what to do with black men. We found we had unmet cultural needs of religious and emotional expression within the community. Yet the Baha'i writings allow us to be recognized as equal participants at the table. God himself has recognized us and given our existence purpose and meaning. The singular role of the gathering is to provide the means for opening the pupil of the eye through which the light of the spirit will shine. We leave the gathering able to survey the social landscape with new eyes and a new heart. And we yearn for all the people of the world, especially other men who are black, to see what we now see, to know what we now know, and to feel what we now feel. Miraculously, the anger, cynicism, and bitterness of our past is being replaced by warm joy and emotions, which can only be described as love. Yet, we are saddened because of the spiritual plight of our brothers, a condition which has its deep roots in the haunting memories of slavery and the debilitating effects of racism. And remembrance of thee. 
is my remedy. Well, the Universal House of Justice uh, prompted me to make the trip. After going to the, uh, the gathering and studying the uh, message uh, for the four-year plan, and that African Americans were asked to go to, um, to Africa, south of the Sahara, uh, by the Universal House of Justice. And we take that very personally. I take it very personally that this message is for me. There is going to be a total of 53 going this year. And it's not going to be in one particular region. It's going to be all over, everywhere south of the Sahara. And um, to my knowledge, this has never taken place before on this large of a scale with Baha'is and brothers. And so that's very special. The Universal House of Justice wants us to, to encourage and inspire uh, African believers who are poised on, uh, on the edge of great things in the faith. When we go there, um, we go there with that in mind, to be of service and to inspire, you know, encourage. And we wind up getting encouraged and inspired. It's nice to be in January 2000, 53 African American men traveled to Africa. They began their journey in spiritual preparation in New York. The men divided into 11 teams spread throughout 16 sub-Saharan countries. You know, when I think about, you, know, you come back to the question about how historic of this is, these people arose to open up this continent, and this is where maybe we see massive entry by troops. But to think that I could be in the beginning of the first all Baha'i country. We could have visited there and, and inspired the brothers to, the African brothers, to transform and take over the entire continent and set the stage for all. And all I did was just get on an airplane, suck up my fears, read a few prayers, and showed up. At the conclusion of their trip, the well-worn travel teachers visited the Baha'i World Center. On a rainy and cold Thursday, January 27, 53 African-American men arrived at the Pilgrim House after two and a half weeks of traveling teaching. The travelers then visited the seat of the Universal House of Justice. For many of the friends, this was their first visit. All seemed to be profoundly moved by the beauty of the environment. In the afternoon, they traveled to Bahchi and the Holy Shrine of Baha'u'llah. Under the protection of umbrellas, the friends began by circumambulating the outer walk at Bachi, proceeding through the Collins Gate and down the pathway leading to the Holy Shrine, stopping occasionally in reflection. And now, I'm walking the grounds that the manifestation of God, I don't, it doesn't matter, even if I couldn't even enter the tomb, if I could, I had to circumambulate around the whole mountain, that's the close, it, that's, that's enough. I've made it, I mean, and I know that God will give me whatever I need to when I get there. It's, um, I, I just know that the, uh, the rest and the peace that I'll finally receive there if I'm quiet and I understand and I listen to it on the way there because I see this journey as I'm receiving the confirmations on the way there that the reward is to actually obtain the presence to be in the room that's the reward in the evening the men offered stories of their journey to the staff at a facility specially rented for this occasion Many of the men had only a few hours sleep the previous night, and yet the offering of their stories brought both tears of joy 
and rings of laughter. I have to do this. Uh, Dr. Roberts' wisdom, Baha'u'llah's wisdom, put this man in charge of our team. He took some hard-headed fellas that had their own agendas and made them work. Uh, yes. Is there any removal of difficulty? The power of these trips have had a profound effect on the lives of the participants and the communities they return to. You tap into that larger vision through hopefully an act of service. Um, that is extremely critical for any Baha'i community. Um, and I think in this case specifically, with the problems of race uh, that we've had in, um, in America, um, my going or anyone's going to Africa and connecting with the people there and getting a sense of like um, the, the role of Africans and people of Af African descent um, in this in larger plan and able to bring that back to America in a land that has been, have, uh, does have problems with race. That can be, I think, uh, help open the minds of people in, in, uh, of the American Baha'i community and enlighten all of us. These are the fruits of the gathering. As our love for our Lord grows into even more wondrous fruits, as our obedience to our supreme institution becomes even more manifest, and as the bond of our unity expands to the degree all hearts of the world are embraced, we will find that we, indeed, will be in the front ranks of the march, leading our brothers and sisters, regardless of skin color, to the promised land, to their true home. Confirmations alone can change a net into an eagle.
Marl Brothers. Uh, that's quite a memorable film. I know it probably brings a lot of memories for all of us uh, from our experience just recently at this year's Black Man's Gathering. Before we went away uh, to see the film, we, we discussed why is it in a faith that talks about unity would a specific sector of that faith meet to address particular needs. And Anise, I think you were going to read something for us from one, one of the quotes. Mm -hmm. This diversity, this difference is like the naturally created dissimilarity and variety of the limbs and organs of the human body, for each one contributeth to the beauty, efficiency, and perfection of the whole. Abdul Baha. Hmm. So I guess this speaks to what, what we've been saying is that there's a reason for variety in nature. There is a reason for variety in people. You know, we're not all just one, this homogenous thing out there. We <coughs> are all unique. And because of these varieties, certain groupings have certain needs. Anise, this was your first gathering. Yeah, yeah. Just real briefly, give us just a couple of just a, just a couple of your uh, impressions. It it was thoroughly one of the most incredible experiences I've ever gone through. It um, I arrived there and ninety five brothers up there who just just embraced me, um, uh, regardless of my past or what I've done or just anything, you know, just, just love me for the fact that, you know, that God made all of us. And um, they helped to foster that love inside me to, to want to give that to every single soul that I come across. Mm -hmm. And it was just such a, such a, a sharing of fellowship and love and helped to connect myself to a lot more to trying to figure out who I am and where I come from. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, was, it was really something. It's really something else. And of course, brothers, we are going to be having this d dialogue on an ongoing basis. So I want the, the, uh, s the, the audience at home to know that each of these gentlemen will be back to talk about uh, many things, but particularly this really unique situation with this Black Man's Gathering. Rick, you've been to several Black Man's Gatherings. Yes. Uh, we have just a couple minutes. But you hadn't been to one in a couple of years, and you came to this one. What are some of your impressions? Well, actually, I've been with it so long, I've forgotten what a pylon was like. <laughs> <laughs> and I really enjoyed that. Yes, yes. Because uh, it makes you know that there has to be love in order for mankind to unite. Mm -hmm. Without it, it's a fizzle. Right, right. You're absolutely right, my friend. But out of the black men gathering, it's sort of rekindling me a desire that uh, will never die mm. in telling people about by faith the love of Baha'u'llah and his coming mm -hmm. and that God's latest manifestation for the salvation of all mankind. Hmm. Well, you know, ditto, I can say to that. Uh, Daryl and I had the opportunity a couple years ago because of our participation in the Black Man's Gathering to uh, go to Haifa, go to Africa. Uh, what are some of your reflections, Darrell, on some of the things that have happened in the faith regarding the, the black man's gathering? Hmm. The gathering is, uh, <laughs> the gathering is awesome, <laughs> to say the least. If anybody seeing this show can imagine a hundred black men mm coming together from everywhere in the United States for seven full days from sunup prayer session to sundown midnight burning oil more prayer sessions mm -hmm. the unity and the harmony for seven days mm -hmm. with a hundred black men mm -hmm. I can't say this enough yeah. because when I experienced it it was so overwhelming that I was like, this can't be real. Mm -hmm. but then I went to three more gatherings and it was still real. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, man, I can't, it's, 
it's almost indescribable. Yes. I know we're here trying to give our uh, take on what the gathering was when we went there, but um, it was truly God on earth. Mm. Mm. And um, the effects it's had on me, you know, you, my pops, mm -hmm. we went to the gathering. Many of the gatherings I went to, we were tag team, mm. and the gathering took us from South Carolina to Elliott, Maine, to South West Africa, mm -hmm. to Haifa, Israel, back to Savannah, Georgia. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's just a, a glimpse of the magnitude of the gathering and mm -hmm. the Baha'i faith. Mm -hmm. And um, we could talk for about 40 more shows about right. the gathering. <laughs> but of course, we have only a little time <laughs> yeah, left yeah. on this one. And, no and it's, it's, you know, I, I share the enthusiasm, you know, uh, that all the brothers have, have uh, stated on this show. But one of the interesting things about the gathering is that for me, it attached me very strongly to who I am. And that in this faith, when unity is the key word, also uniqueness is. And you get to be you in this faith. You don't, to be part of the group, you still get to be you. As a matter of fact, you're commanded to be you and bring all the goodness that you have with you. And so the gathering has a very practical application that we're going to explore in some detail. Uh, we'll also talk about in the future these trips to Africa were in response to our institution calling for men of African descent to travel to Africa. We didn't all just get together and decide, well, hey, we're African men, let's go to Africa. The Universal House of Justice the governing body of the Baha'i Faith wrote in their, in their Ridvan letter for African Americans to travel to Africa. And all we did was respond. But the, the uh, Black Man's Gathering was that tool. My brothers, we will come back and talk about this in great detail in further shows. I'm happy we were able to do this very special show today. And I want to just say, for right now, we'll see you next time.